Thank you to Herman Marshall Whiskey for sponsoring another episode of Suds with Luds. Herman Marshall produces small batch, handcrafted, and award-winning whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels. Whether it's their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. Make sure you ask for it by name. Thank you again, Herman Marshall Whiskey. Well, welcome into another episode of Suds with Luds. Uh, today, I have a little ball of hate uh, as my guest today, Bob Basson, uh, director of the Alumni Association, and he was a little a little devil to play against. Bass, thanks for coming. Good First to be off, here, Luds. Good to be here. Uh, uh, yeah, and I know in your you had to drive. You had, what, by the way, so. How often do you actually get come down to American Airlines? Only on game days? Because your office is in Frisco where the Stars rank at. You don't come down here for any other events like Stars, Stars games, do you? Correct, yeah. Do you come down here for any events and things like that? Off, you know what I mean? You guys do so many events around town. But Yeah, once in a while we come downtown. We, we do different events, sometimes at the American Airlines Center, but very often. I live up in Frisco. Yeah. I'm about 10 minutes from work, and I love it up there. How long did it take you to get here today? Not bad in the middle of the day, right? No. I mean, Traffic-wise. So saying that, uh, everybody's somewhat complaining about the 8.30 starts, and I'm yeah. loving the 8.30 starts because I I can leave my house at like 7.30, and I'm here at 8 o'clock. Yeah. And uh, and the ones that are complaining are the ones that have the kids and stuff like that. And they, right. They actually have – what time – do you are you have to be in the office every day at a certain time, or are you kind of on your <laughs> – Yeah, sure. You can, okay. <laughs> no, so that, I, I get in about uh, – 9.30 every day. How about on a late games like this? Well, so the first game that went into double overtime, Yeah, I uh, I got home about, let me see. That was, was around 2.30, yeah. yeah, about 2, 2.30. Got to bed at 3, got in the office about 10 o'clock, and I almost fell asleep in my office. Sure. And then everybody was like that in our office because everybody went to the game. And I... Instantly thought, well, what do the players feel like? Because they just played, you know, five periods. And then it just, it reminded me what it what it takes to play the game at a high level. And then in the playoffs at a higher level. And then you probably don't sleep. I remember many nights I didn't sleep all night because you think about the game. Yeah. And uh, here I'm complaining that I, I'm tired in the office. So, um, but... <laughs> We were a little bit more well conditioned probably then than we are right. now. We could use our sleep, which I get none. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so today we're going to go through a few things. Uh, I mean, you've, I want, obviously, I'm going to talk about your career, uh, how you got started, uh, starting out in Medicine Hat. We'll talk about the Alumni Association. Uh, I want to talk about your son, Riley. Um, he's playing in the USHL now. Uh, his first year there, came through the program here in Dallas. We'll talk about the youth hockey here, which I'd love to get your opinion on some of them things because you know I'm very opinionated on it, opinionated on it. <laughs> but since you brought up the playoffs, let, let's start there. Um, as we record this today, it's Monday. Um, the Dallas Stars yesterday, uh, game four, won that game three to two in Minnesota. It's now the the best of three. In a series, I think we kind of expected it to go this way. But the playoffs have been, the, the games have been incredible. <clears throat> Only two series, I think, right now. The Boston-Florida series is three games to one for Boston. And then the Carolina Islander series is uh, three games to one. But besides that, they're either two to one, game four tonight, or they're tied. Dallas being tied two to two. <clears throat> Great hockey. You get up today, whether you watch the news or you're listening on the radio, everything is about officiating. And let's talk about the Dallas game last night. Um, good news is Dallas won. Okay. Your opinion. Do you get a chance? Do you watch all the games? I, uh, like, I, you know, I'm talking now during playoffs. Do you stay up and watch all the games? Every single game you mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I watch, for example... I watched LA and Edmonton. It was three nothing after one, and I didn't think Edmonton had a sniff. And I went to bed, and I woke up, and they won in overtime. And I was like, because the atmosphere there in the first period, I didn't think 
Edmonton had a chance, right. you know, but when you have good players like that, uh, obviously they, they came through. So I, I, I missed two periods and wished I would have stayed up for that. I watch some of the games. I watch all the stars game and some of the other games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I got a, it, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, fans complain, especially if they're on the East coast and talk about games on the West coast, you know? So, um, but yeah, that game actually, when it was three to nothing, I watched LA in their own zone and I'm like, man, they're just, they're just trying to keep them on the perimeter. Mm -hmm. They didn't force anything. And I'm thinking, this is kind of a matter of time. You're just letting them. And, and Edmonton was all over. Uh, Corpus Allo, the goaltender for L.A., was playing great. Um, and then all of a sudden, the first one, then the second one, then the third one. And you could just feel it tilt. And that game also was a controversial call. Puts uh, Edmonton on the power play at the end. They score a power play goal. So Dallas game. <clears throat> And we'll talk about, and I'll just, I'm staying right down the middle on this thing. Uh, Felino, well, first off, Minnesota, Billy Guerin had come out, their general manager, come out uh, a couple weeks before the playoffs started and talked about the identity of their team. They're a team that's hard to play against. We were at, we were up in the suite, game one, when Joe Pavelski got hit by Matt Dumba. And it's funny because if there would be, I believe, if there were, would have been some younger people up there that played hockey, they maybe would have had a di different opinion of the opinion that you had, the opinion that I had. Stephen Johns, former Dallas Stars player, was up there. Um, even when they went to review on that hit, uh, Stephen looked over and just said, they're calling this back. There's, that's not a bad hit. So, and there's a lot of people that will, and again, I'm trying to talk about as if we're not a Dallas Stars fan or a Minnesota fan. So that happens in that series. Now today, after yesterday's game, the, the uh, game four, um, Marcus Foligno gets called for a hit on Hockenpah that Hockenpah has the puck in his feet and he gets called for, I believe it was interference, which I don't know what that actually means when you have the puck. Right. Um, and then the one kind of towards the end of the game. He caught they called him for tripping. They called they called that one was for tripping. Yeah. On Marchman. And he ended up and 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 I don't blame Marchman for what he did. Got his stick up. No, it wasn't protect on, himself, right? It was on Felino. Felino got the no, penalty. I know Felino did, but yeah. Marchman gets his stick up. Yeah. And then Mar and then Felino gets cut on the nose <laughs> and he gets one on the head. And they called that tripping. Yeah. So in your eyes, just if you're down right down the middle of the fairway, are those penalties in your mind or how do you see it? Now, I know you got to go back to the office. <laughs> How do you see it? Well, Lutz, let me put it this way. I love um, watching skill, mm -hmm. but I love, still love the physicality of the game. It's, 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 what, it's what the playoffs are known for, and I think it's the reason that there's a lot of people around sports and not just in hockey They will say that it's the hardest trophy to win. I mean, because you're playing the same team every other night for 14 days. And then you got to do it again, do it again, do it again, and and so it becomes a battle, and and then the, it becomes the the war of words in between the games. You know, like there's a lot of comments out there, and and it'll come from both sides. And even in the Toronto the Toronto you know series with Tampa Bay, that there was a huge hit put on you know one of their best players, Lapointe, and that started a big fight. And then Keith from the Leaf says one thing and Cooper says something, you know, and, and so it becomes that and that, and it's, and everything is under the microscope in the playoffs. Right. And, and it becomes what we used to call bold bulletin board material. And you look right. and you try to get your players to just shut up, you know, let's get ready for the next game. Don't give them any ammo. Don't put any, don't give them anything to work off of. And so I want to, <clears throat> I want to read this to you. And, and this is Pete DeBoer. Now setting this up, I will say that, so Billy Guerin, my opinion, has, and Billy Guerin's won three Stanley Cups, um, hard-nosed player when he played the game, another one of those guys you want on your team, don't want to play against, um, general manager of Minnesota Wild. Well, he's come out and said, this is who we are. This is our identity. They've got an identity. They're hard to play against. There's no question that they are hard to play against. And all those players live up to that identity. So does Dean Evanson. And you know Dino, mm -hmm. and he's a fiery kind of coach, right? So here, here's what Coach Pete DeBoer said after the game. It's the special teams were a big part and were a good special 
team's team. We have been all year long. I've said this before. They take penalties, and and they do. And when they do, we're going to make them pay. I believe. What do you what do you hear out of that? Is he saying anything out of that, or or is he just being straight up? That's who we are. Basically, there we we know they're a team that takes penalties. We have good special teams, and that's what we do. And we're going to make them pay. Well, I, I think there's a lot of truth in that, but the way they came out, they played they played pretty physical. The stars they played really physical. I go back to the. There was about a month left in the season, and Colorado came in here, mm-hmm. and we just ran them, mm-hmm. and they beat them seven three, I think. Yes. So yes. they they have the ability and have some players that can play physical. I think he's just saying, you know, we have to be the more disciplined team, and if you're if you're going to take penalties against us, we're going to make you pay. They have a great power play, so I, you know what, Lutz, uh, Suter, I, I watched him like whole year and. Sometimes I love him. Sometimes I don't. Like he's, yeah. like all of us. We it's later in our career, but let me tell you, who is he? I targeted? love him right now yes. because he's he's seasoned. He he's making them pay. We've all seen it, but he doesn't take penalties. They come after him, and he just skates away. Skates away, like. Which you is could, which is even more frustrating, isn't it? Oh my gosh! And so, like, you can't buy. Uh, that seasoned veteran mm-hmm. um, and all those young defensemen and players, they're probably looking at that going, man, look at, look at this guy. Like he's a big part of our team. So and who, it, it's who he's hard on the most. So he's playing with Merrill most of it, most of the time. Yeah. And I was, I was like you also, I'm like, man, I don't know. And, and so suits when he, in his, in his prime, he led the league in minutes played every mm-hmm. year. He would play, I mean, his average was right around 30 minutes, playing half the game. Well, he's 38 now, 37, 38 years old. So, yeah, you're right. There's times, you you know, he does this and does that. But he's smart because now he's playing with Miranda going, oh, boy. So now he's going to be on the ice half the game. He picks up the end of the power plays at times. But to me, they're matched up against their top line. Yeah. And it's Kirill. Kaprizov, their best player. That's who he's the hardest on. He gives them the cross checks in the back, and they're kind of sneaky ones. We see them because they're on TV. There's you know thirty five cameras in the building. Referees don't get to see that all the time, and I think he's really good being sneaky and cagey. So that's important in that. But the reason I ask you about that comment, what I read in that comment is the part about we have really good special teams and we'll make them pay. Is he trying to? Put plant a seed in the Minnesota Wild that you guys want to keep taking dumb penalties. We're going to keep on scoring on you. And their their power play is like 55, 56% right now, which is lights out every other time they score. Is he trying to get them to change their game? Mm. Does he want them to pull back a little bit? And, and because, and that leads me to a guy like Jason Robertson. We haven't seen a lot of robo. Right. And I look at Robo and we know he's a great player. We know he can score goals, but like you talk about Suter, Suter is being hard on their best player. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not saying that Robertson is the best player. I mean, to me, Hintz is incredible. I mean, and he's plowing through, he's got to plow through. We're missing Joe, but we need, we're going to need Robertson. Okay. And I look, so he's played 210 games in the NHL. I think he has 104 goals. So basically, he scores every other game. He's got 234 points, so he's over a point per game. But in the playoffs, he's played 11 games, and he's got two goals. It doesn't really mean anything. It's early in his career. But Robo has to do more. He's got to get dirtier. And there are times that I. it looks like he's got his head on a swivel. And so are they making sure that he's looking over his shoulder all the time, making sure that he's not part of their success. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Is Pete DeBoer trying, you know, playing this game, <laughs> you know, trying to maybe get them to back off. Hey, you guys want to take penalties? We're going to score on you, which they're doing that. Do you think there's a message between any of that from DeBoer? Yeah, there could be Luds, but I, I don't see them backing off. Like, I, I think like a guy like Felino is going to, he's probably going to have, He's going to hit guys hard and think about not taking a penalty, which sometimes you walk that line and you know, as well as anybody, if you walk that line and you happen to get a penalty, um, 
So I think he he might be sending that message, but I don't see them backing off. Yeah, I don't. Even, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I I Jason, you know, I thought about this the other day at the home game, and you and I played similar, and I never really thought of it from a Mike Medano standpoint or the best players on the other team. Like the I played when I. The prime of my career, I played against the best players like Mo, mm -hmm. and I just tormented Mo. You know, like I, I and in the playoffs, we would just run, just like Felina, we'd run them as hard Const as we every time you get a yeah. Chance. And to me, that's the, that's who I was. That's mm -hmm. who you were. That's how you made it in this league, right? It didn't. It didn't come very hard, you know. Like yeah. that's that's how we made it. That's how you we still do it in alumni games. <laughs> Jesus, Bass and I yeah. usually play on different teams. I don't know why, because you set up the teams. But I get a stick in my ribs and I get a chop behind the leg. And well, that's not true. <laughs> oh, that's true. that's true. That's after I chop you. <clears throat> but but I, I I thought I I I was thinking up in the stands like these top players they play all year now and don't really get run very hard. And then all of a sudden, you know, like they got Felino coming at him at the bench and just running him over. Like that's that's a hard adjustment. Yeah. And as much as we we live in the moment, because you gotta win four games to get onto the next series, or that night, you gotta win. It's a big adjustment for a kid like Robo who now I, he's not gonna adjust and go start running guys, but like how long did it take Mo to actually like get to the point where when guys were running him, he still played his game and he was in the middle of everything? It took a while. And you know who sent that message to Mo? And and Mo will talk about it. I mean, we had him on. <laughs> right. You know, he we had him on here last week, and <clears throat> it was Bob. It was Bob Gainey. Right. You know, and I will remember a specific time, and it was in Minnesota. So Mo had only been in the NHL, you know, probably two three years, maybe about that time. Uh, we were in a game, and uh, Dave Supernot, who was up in the suite, by the way, the other night when we watched Pavs get hit, um, there was a play. And Mo, <laughs> when Mo would get hit, like I think a lot of players do, he might lay there a little bit, and they may embellish a little bit. And and we and as players, there were times with Mike, we'd be going, "Get up, Mo! You didn't get hit that hard. Get up!" You know what I mean? And because we were used to that style that you and I are talking right. about. Well, there was a time he got hit, and Mo went down. <clears throat> And Soup went to, as a matter of fact, I was sitting on the bench, and I don't know who was sitting next to me. Soup put his left arm on my right shoulder, his right arm on whoever was sitting next to me, uh, the next guy, and had his foot up on the boards. And just as he went to get onto the ice, I saw this hand come back, come from the back, and grab Soup right by the belt buckle and pulled him back. And what was said, I won't say exactly, right. but it was basically leave him there. And, and that was to send a message. And you could see Mike at the time kind of laying there, and guys were seeing if he's okay, but he's kind of looking up like, where's my trainer? Is he coming out here or not? And I think that was a that was a, a turning point in that part of the game as along with other things for Mike. And then Mike played right through it after that. You know, he knew that he was that guy, and he found ways to get around it. But it's that message that was sent, and that's why I'm just wondering wh where all this stuff goes. Now, brings up the officiating. Mm -hmm. So... And this isn't just this one series. It's happening in all the series. Things that are bringing about, and I'm just curious about your opinion because I have no idea where I land. Um, and let, let's go, I want to go back to what you talked about. Should there be part of that MO sprinkled in your team for 82 games? Because when you get to the 28 games that are the most important games of the season, which are the playoff games, because we, and I'll just say we did this in Montreal. The style that we played in Montreal was the same, we were going to play that way the, all year long. That, I mean, about tightening games up, playing well mm -hmm. on your own end, you know, all this kind of stuff. Because where teams will, they'll get to the last 20 games of the regular season, something, okay, now we got to start tightening up. You know, playoffs are coming, we got to start playing. Well, why wouldn't you want to play that way the whole year? So now when Colorado went through and won the cup last year, I didn't look at them as a physical team, but there weren't teams that could catch them to hit them. You know what I mean? And they're paying the price a little bit now for guys being injured. But... <clears throat> Should there be more physical play in the Dallas Stars? Should there be a, a little bit more of an element of that, do you think? Or do you think that this game has evolved to where ultimately it's going to be more of a skilled, high-flying team? Because when you look at the Boston Bruins, who had 65 wins this year, they play with an edge. They got guys that have an edge. They play an all-around game. New York Rangers, 
They got a couple guys there. They brought in some elements on into that. And mm-hmm. I believe that these teams are going, this is what we need in the playoffs. Well, I think it's good preparation for the playoffs. Uh, but, you know, like I keep bringing up Felino because he's been the center of the tension in our series, right? Mm-hmm. Imagine if he played 82 games like that, he would be demolished, yeah. right? So, But he's a veteran, right? And you as a veteran, right. you played that way. You knew how to get through the regular season, right. And, right? But I think even, you know, we talked about Robertson, that would be good preparation too for him leading into the playoffs. You know, like if you're in games like that, now you get a taste of that. How and, would, let's let's say you yeah. let's say you work with the team or yeah. downstairs there. Yeah. What kind of conversation would you have? Would you have a conversation with them? With Robertson? Yeah. And I'm sure they are. It's not like yeah. they're not taught. They're all talking. But I mean, would you have any advice for him or would you try to, or maybe you got to start during the regular season? Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, would yeah. you, knowing what you know from the previous playoffs and, and what you see up to now? Well, I saw him in game three here. No, game two here. He reversed hit a guy mm-hmm. over by, I forget who it was. I was like, that's what you got to do. And you got to get into that area where, you know, like you you know, you're going to get a hit and you just reverse. I, I don't, I would never, like I would talk to him if I played with him or if I worked for the stars, I would, wouldn't tell him to go run a guy, but maybe every once in a while you go run a guy and then they know. That you're not going to back off. Right. Yeah. It's, it's. It's good for your teammates to see that, but it's all, as more important. It's good for the other team to see this. Yes, I agree that he he'll fight back. Like, yeah. and again, I go I go back to Kaprizov. <laughs> like somebody chops him, he chops him right back. Yeah, and he but he's a he's a bull. You know, yeah. I, I don't think from a from a stature outlook, Robo's not built like that kid. You like, know what I mean? Lutz, I watched him in game. I think it was game three. And I really didn't, like, I watched him very rarely, but he was running guys after he got hit. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, like, you can't do that kid for the rest of the game because, you know, like, you got to, you got to produce offensively. But it just, like, I just had more respect for him. And I'm guessing his teammates had more respect for him. And I guess the stars, I'm guessing the stars had more respect too. Right. Because he, you can tell he's, he's going to compete. Yeah, he's going to compete. Right. Yeah. No. The good I, news is he hasn't done much from a right. from, from a point standpoint, but be careful talking about guys like that. But man, he he makes play like yes, yeah. He he could have a bunch of points. You, right you now. notice him every shift. Oh he's my on gosh! Yeah. And you talk about being physical. It reminds me of a young Alex Ovechkin. Right. I mean, he ran people over, and I think he's learned as he's gotten older that you know I can't do this as much anymore, and he just continues to score goals. Yeah. So, okay. Let's not beat up on Robo anymore because we know he's a good player. And it's, at some point, he's going to break through. I, that, yeah. I believe he's going to. Um, just don't look to get on the power play and do it. Do it five on five. That That's the important right. part. Um, Otter is right now he's got to be the best goaltender in the playoffs. I mean, I just, I just think that the calmness that he has in his game and watching him as an opponent sitting there playing against him going, this guy doesn't get rattled by anything. You know, how do we, I remember playing against, you know, some of those goaltenders that we played against in, in, in the playoffs and stuff like that. And, and at the time it was about got to bump them. You know, you got to accidentally fall down on top of them. And I don't know if there's, if that's going to happen because that may get called, but um, it's an incredible job that, that Ottinger has been for this team. My gosh, like he, like he takes his mask off in between sh- uh, on whistles, and his hair, and he's shooting water. <laughs> I mean, he's so calm. He's yeah. so relaxed. Like, yeah. um, which is probably a <clears throat> huge strength for any goaltender to not let anything really rattle you. You watch him after a goal scored against him; he has the same demeanor as when he makes three ten bell saves. Yeah, you know, he just seems so grounded. And you know as well as anybody, Luds, when you. When you have a goalie in your team that's calm, it it calms everybody down because yeah. then you know, like I might make a mistake, and you know he's covering me up, so he just calms the whole team down. And like it doesn't matter if you're a mite, if you're six years old, or you're in the NHL in the Stanley Cup playoffs, you need a goalie to play for you. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it playoffs are goaltending <laughs> and special teams. 
I mean, that's yeah. usually what comes down because the five on five stuff usually stays pretty, pretty even. And, and so they give, uh, they give you a chance. Yeah, oh, right? yeah. Yeah. They give you a good chance. So the officials, last thing on these officials, <clears throat> and this is overall, not just playoffs. What are your thoughts? And there's a lot of talk about eye in the sky. You know, there's, <clears throat> there's goalie coaches that are up here and there's concussion spotters. And so they sit up there and they watch when there's a hit and the guy gets up and he's a little woozy. They call down and they take him out. Uh, for that 15 minute timeout, send him to the room. And if he's okay, he comes back. What is your opinion if they took a, an official and put him up there that would be able to communicate with the officials on the ice? Now, just to be able to relay, get his view. Like, you know how during the playoffs, they're always taken, like Dave Jackson is one of the officials, and, you know, they'll go to him at breaks and stuff like that and get their opinions and stuff like that. Because there is there is conversation about should you have a third eye or an eye in the sky as an official up there that just is sitting up there watching the game in every playoff building and has some way to communicate. I don't know if they're talking about in the course of the game, which I highly doubt because they don't, I don't believe they have microphones um, or when they go over to the box, would that be their first call instead of calling back to Toronto or a certain calling out? You think that's good or bad? Or is that just that, because from a stat that I heard was these officials get 99.5% of the calls, right? That's just how good they are. Do you just leave it alone and just chalk this up to be, because there are a lot of things right now that are being called wrong or not being called at all. I, I think it's actually, I, I, my initial thought is it's a good idea. Yeah. Especially if it's a, a veteran guy that's retired and he yep. knows exactly what they're going through. Yeah. They, you know, they have a lot of pressure on them too. You know, the refs do. And they, like you said, they get it right most of the time. Um, I think they, they're humans and they get influenced by what's happened. You think they're not influenced by Pavelski mm -hmm. getting knocked out? Like, they don't want anybody hurt either. And, you know, game, I guess it was game two here. We were up and they started calling 10 minute misconducts at the end of the game. Yeah. They don't want anybody hurt. Well, they were just taking control. Yeah, they, they, they didn't want the, the shit game. to get out of hand. Just go. Yeah. Go. Yeah. And, and if, the, and they're, if they're going to start sending out these kind of guys at these part of the game, easy, just take 10, you're gone. Yeah. I, I you know, they, they've got, Instant replay now. They have they can go to the penalty box and review. Like the the penalty on Hockenbach, mm -hmm. is that how you say it? Yeah. Yeah. He didn't even touch the guy. Like so like that to me that was a really critical part of the game. We as the stars didn't get scored on our Oh, you're talking about what they called tripping. Game four, yeah. He, he tripped. actually he hit him on the side of the leg or something like that and called a tripping call. Right. So like yeah. Either a, a, a eye in the sky or even a review when it's maybe the last, even the last five minutes of the game. Yeah. Like they would have reviewed that and go, that's not a penalty. Right. Yeah. They probably would have reviewed um, uh, the, the Felino's Felino. penalty too. So the two it, of them, both of them. Right, right. I mean, they'd have called both of them and called them back. That's yeah, what they, I mean. They have I, a tough job though. I think you got to be I, careful I of I'd how much that. you want to review. Because again, yeah. I think I I think that the whole thing, and, and I think that's the reason baseball's gone to the, the clock and stuff with the yeah. pitches. They want to get the fans yeah. in and out. You know, they don't want to have to spend the whole night there. So yeah, you you'd be sitting there a lot watching, I think. Yeah, if, yeah but yeah. But maybe if it's the last two to five minutes, it mm -hmm. might be it's so critical. Yeah. No, I agree. It's most, yeah. especially with a couple of teams like this, because I think you expect this to be one goal game all the time, with right. the exception of Anthony Cole. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the goaltending. Uh, the other kids playing well for them too. So, um, well, what's your opinion tomorrow night, Tuesday night in Dallas, Game Five? What do you see? What well, do you feel? Well, Luds is, is as you know, it's the most important game of the series because yeah. it's best of three, and if the stars. Don't win tomorrow night. It's you... funny. Yesterday's game was the biggest of the series, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's the way the playoffs are. Yeah. yeah. But you're home. Um, you know, the other team, the wild just got beat and they want to, you know, like the momentum, as you know, you dig in even more to yeah. win that next game. Is there pressure? Do you think there's pressure because you're at home? I would think there is only, I mean, we know, geez, I sound like we never played before, but, but we don't, <laughs> you don't want to go into their building knowing that that's an elimination game. No way. Especially the, I mean, they have a lively building. Yeah. 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 They, yeah, that's, it's important to, 
as much as, and you know this, as much as you think about, we just won our last game, I got to dig in harder. Mm-hmm. It, for but, some reason, it's not that easy. Without and the crossing other, the line. Right. Yeah. And the other team naturally is coming off a loss and they, they're, they're coming hard. So, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. It's the most important game of the series. Let's talk a little bit about Bob Basson. So, never drafted. Played over 700, 765 games in the NHL. You kind of talked a little bit about your style. It's pretty, I mean, if you haven't had a chance to watch Bass play, you, you ought to YouTube them instead of YouTubing all the highlights. Some of these young kids, that, that that's our biggest battle is YouTube, by the way. You know, like you try to get them to play the right game. These young guys, you know, the 50, the 16s, the 18s, and have you ever watched so-and-so play? That's the kind of player you're going to be. Like, who do you watch? Oh, what's YouTube? Got a lot of I said, yeah, YouTube is the highlight reels of the best players in the game that you're probably not going to be like that. We're not trying to, you know, throw, throw you in a shitter, but, you know, this is who you're going to be. But anyway, um, Bash, you, you started in Medicine Hat. I want to talk about your last two years. You played, what, three years in Medicine Hat and juniors and out west, right? Well, I played. Um, you played in the, in the age, uh, the AJ? Yeah, Alberta Junior Hockey League. So, I made the Medicine Hat Tigers when I was 17 and I was about 140 <laughs> pounds. And my dad, you know, my dad played in the NHL. He was yeah. a goalie. And he said, you're going to go back. I pre, you know, he appreciated that I made the team, but he said, you're going to come back to Calgary and play for the Calgary Spurs in the Alberta Junior Hockey League. And I you're was pissed. so mad. Yeah, I, I think I cried on the way home because as you know, like, you know, like that's a hard that's a hard league to make, first yeah. of all. And so um, I'm so grateful for my parents because they knew I would have got destroyed uh, playing for Medicine Hat at 17. There's 17 year olds now that are 200 pounds. Yeah. They can play in the. I, I yeah. wasn't one of them. I was a late. What did you play at in pro? What was your, what was <clears> your weight? Well, I, I went to the Islanders as a, like, I made it as a 20 year old, but I was only like maybe one. I wasn't even 160, I don't think. And see, that's when that was when it was a big boy league, right? Yep. It's like <laughs> like to be 160 in today's game is so, different. Lud, so my my very first training camp, I'm playing with all the guys that I admired, right? I mean, they just won four cups. Kelly Rudy was the backup goalie, right? And um they give you grays, gray t shirt, mm -hmm. gray oh, shorts. <laughs> and <laughs> The 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 um the shorts came down to like way down below my knees, and the shirt came down. <laughs> Kelly Rudy, did I Kelly can Rudy, see the veteran players just having a time with you. I got my grays on, and Kelly Rudy thought I was a stick boy, and asked him to go <laughs> asked me to go get tape for him. I'm like Kelly, I'm I'm trying out for this team. <laughs> I'll never forget that. But um, thank goodness for a, a dryer that I shrink those. <laughs> <laughs> but uh so I was um yeah I went back and played Alberta Junior Hockey League. Thank you for my parents that I probably would have quit hockey or would have got destroyed as a 17-year-old. I played there and then I um I made the team the next year in Medicine Hat as an 18-year-old. Yeah, but as grow, growing up <clears throat> before you, before then. Yeah. Where you played? Were you goal scorer? Oh yeah. We but were you were you a shit disturber too? Or was it more you were into the goal thing? The reason I ask you that is because your first year, oh, your first full year, I, I call it your ass too. You had 30, 29 goals, 93 PIMS. Mm -hmm. And then your next year, you had 32 goals and 143. Yeah. So <clears throat> was it more goal scoring or was it, it was just a combination of both? I grew up like, just like you, I was not to brag. I was one I of the best. I didn't score 23 goals in my, uh, since uh, yet I still haven't scored 23 goals in a year. <laughs> So well, you're a D man. Yeah. <clears throat> but I was like most guys that played in the NHL, I was one of the best players, not to brag, but growing up. Yeah. Um, but I hit hard. Yeah. I, I it like you, it's just ingrained. That's how I, I think it's our personality plus how we grew up, who we played against. Yeah. And so um I I hit a lot. I had when I became a parent and had Riley playing, hitting guys. Mm-hmm. I then knew what my parents went through. There were a few nights watching Concerned. Riley. No, there's a few nights when I watched Riley, I wanted to hide under a, a chair because like every parent, oh. 
every parent was mad at me, you know, like, yeah. and, and my wife. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, what was your question? No, you're, you're answering yeah. it. That's good. I, yeah. I, but <clears throat> I mean, you, you're not drafted. You play a certain way. I'm wondering when you go from there, <laughs> from Medicine Hat to the New York Islanders, mm-hmm. first off, how did you get there? How did, how did it, how are you contacting me? You're not drafted. Right. So you have an agent that says, Hey, you got to try out or who, who comes up to you. And, and, and when you go New York Islanders, like, didn't they just get done winning four Stanley cups in a row? Right. Kind of team. So what happened was I played a year in Calgary, Alberta junior hockey league for the Spurs. The next year I had a pretty good year and then uh playoffs came and I had a great playoff. Uh-huh. Right. And everybody said I was going to get drafted. Didn't get drafted. You know, like I'm reading the paper the next day and like Look at, looking for your name. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> I, I had thoughts of quitting. Like I thought I'm going to go back and play for the university of Calgary, get a degree. And then Ed Chenoweth, who was the president of the Western hockey league at the time had ties with the, um, with the Islanders. And he must've, like put a good word. I in owe, like you know, there's lots of people that influenced your career, and he was one of them. My mm-hmm. parents. I had uh, Jim Hunter, who was a a downhill skier on the Canadian Olympic team, taught me how to train. But Ed Shanouth, you know, like was one of the key guys that helped me because without open that door, yeah, without that, like yeah. you just maybe that's it. Like you got one opportunity. And, um, yeah, but again, you're going into, you have a certain style, right? Yeah. Your goals are this, but your physical play is part of your identity. I mean, you're going into a, a into, into an organization that has guys like Clark Gillies, you know, I mean, you talk about some of the guys that they had some, and that was that makeup of how, why, and how they won Stanley cups. Are you playing that way in training camp? So Luds, I was, I went in, I got a tryout. Okay. And, um, I wasn't very big. And like you said, they had just won four cups and Clark Gillies, Bobby Nystrom. These were tough guys, right? Denny Potvin. Oh my gosh. So like I knew that, but as a young kid who wants to make it and probably doesn't even know any better, Mm -hmm. I remember I I went to training camp and I was like running Clark Gillies and Bobby Nye and they were like, they didn't know if they should kill me. I was small and they probably like, man, I better not beat up this little kid. But I opened up in someone's eyes in like, they were like, holy, who is this guy? Yeah. Right. And they, um, and then they kind of take you under their wing and they get a fondness to you. Well, I don't think they like me running them, but I mean, I'm talking about management. I opened up their eyes. Right. And they're like, well, who is this kid? And they signed, they gave me $5,000 to sign. They gave me a, a contract. Actually, it happened. We were in Philadelphia exhibition game, driving back to the island, and um, the GM, which was um, what's his name, he, uh, anyways, he calls me the front of the bus, and I'm thinking it's where all the junior. It's the time when all the junior players are going back to, you know, back to junior. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I sit up at the front of the bus on the way back. He goes, Bob, we like what you, we see. We're going to sign you to a contract. So they gave me five grand to sign. And I think I made, I was making 45,000 yeah. in the NHL. And it gave me my start, you know? Um, so <clears throat> that's how it started. And then, uh, then I went back, I played junior one more year and I, I got a trial for the, the Canadian junior team for the world juniors. So you guys want, did you win a gold medal? We won a gold medal. Yeah. And then they, they re-signed me for some more money because now they, they thought they had something. And so now your first year when they signed, <laughs> did you get any, did you play any games? No, I went back okay. to junior. Okay. So you go yeah. back to junior. Yeah. Then you come back. Yeah. Then I, so now I, you, now <laughs> the guys know who you are. Yeah. But right? I, but I, um, I went back to junior and I made the world junior team. So I was an undrafted guy with tw- 19 guys that were like almost first rounders, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. so the Islanders are like. <laughs> you found a diamond in the rough. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Torrey. Bill yeah. Torrey was yeah. our GM at the time. So, yeah. And then. And is this where you run into our old buddy, Mick Vakota? 
Yeah. <laughs> you you, yeah. you end up living in Worcester, didn't you? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, it was my, uh, it wasn't until my, let's see, I was, um, I was part of three or four years with the Islanders. My last year I lived with Mick. Um, sure. Nice having him as your friend. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, big daddy. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's funny, like Mick, <clears throat> Mick and I became very good friends and he actually came to Wisconsin, laid my bike down one morning and stuff like that. When I told him not to ride, cause he never rode before, bought my kids a go-kart, like one of the yeah. nicest guys on the planet. It's funny. Like I was, when I did the podcast with Mick, we were talking about, I, I was talking about you and I, and I called you this and I said, Jesus, he's this little Tasmanian devil. We were talking about Bobby Bass and I said, this little Tasmanian devil on the ice run around and stuff like that. I get done with the podcast with Mick and I went, Tasmanian devil. I went, oh no. Well, when I was in there, New York with him, I don't know if I was him when this happened, but I ended up at some tattoo place three o'clock in the morning and got a tattoo <laughs> And it's and I have a tattoo on me. It's a Tasmanian devil with a beer <laughs> beer mug in one hand and a baseball bat in the other. And I told Mick and I said, Jesus, I'm walking around with Bob Bass on, on my hip. There's only one problem <laughs> though that you just got to get rid of the beer, right? Yeah, I know, I know. I can put a glass of wine in there. Lud, um, Luds, I, I got to tell you this story though. So, um, my very first year, like played physical, running around, right against like. I mean, it was not the Broad Street bully era, but we caught the end of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so Clark Gillies was on my, I was center. Clarky was my left wing. And if all the people listening, he was one of the toughest guys in the league when they won four cups. And so I could run around and, you know, guys would want to come and grab me and tear me apart. And then Clarky would just skate into the pile and everybody would back off. And then Clarky got, he signed with Buffalo the next year. <laughs> so, so the little Tasmanian devil had to fight it. A little, fight for himself. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> I'll tell you about Clarky. So <laughs> it was my sec, I don't know, second year. I don't know which year it was. Anyway, we're, I, don't, I think it was on the island. And I was, you know, yeah, I'm running around and stuff like that. And it comes to a face off. And um, <laughs> he's supposed to be on that wing, but he lines up over here and he lines up next to me. And he just kind of nudges me a little bit. And he looked at me and he goes, Hey kid, want to get your feet wet? <laughs> and I just looked up at him I'm like, "No, I'm good." Not and he goes, I... "Stop running around." Then I said, "Okay," <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. Like I'm not running around anymore. <clears throat> no, big man uh, passed away what a year or two ago. Yeah. Uh, just a superhuman being, and they missed a good one there. One of the best teammates. Yeah. Him and Bobby Bourne, Bobby Nye. I mean, you had some Mike Bossy was there when you played. Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, again, I, I go through your, where'd you go after that? Chicago for a little pit stop. Yeah. But, but I, I looked at some of the teams. So you go from where was Chicago, St. Louis, right? I went from Chicago. Did you go to, uh, I went to, you go to Quebec. I know where you went. Jesus. Best. No, you, I went to St. Louis, remember. St. Louis. I went to St. Yeah, Louis after St. Louis. Chicago. Then I went to Quebec. Yeah. But you know, like I want to bring up Bobby, um, born and Clark Gillies and Nye, like, okay, well, Borny, we have a common thing there. You coached with yeah. Borny. Did you coach with Borny? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was coaching Kalamazoo and then we went to Salt Lake city right? and I was with Borny. And so you coached with him too. And, yeah. and with the stars minor league team. Yeah. But as a young guy, and you know, this as well as anybody, like you, you're getting your feet wet and you're just trying to survive. Right. And you're young and it's like, when you get a guy like Clark Gillies or any veteran on a team and they come in beside you and help you. It's invaluable. Like yep. every young, like I know Pawalski with Johnson. Johnson lives with them. Like those are. See, those I are, had Larry Robinson. Yeah. See, so yeah, they're so important. And uh, then you become a veteran, and you don't re, you don't soon rem, uh, forget that. Well, for young guys. But see, that's the thing is in Montreal. And I've told this story <clears> before. <throat> they have a, a logo. And at the time, it was only in French, and I believe now it's in French and English. But it, it was from a poem, uh, Flanders Field, I think it was what the poem was, a line out of there. But it, it basically, short version is, from these failing hands, we pass this torch, yours mm -hmm. to be held high, blah, blah, blah. And I must have looked at the thing for three years, didn't know what the hell it meant. But then, and, and then I look back, and I'm like, 
that's what Larry was doing. Like Larry was helping me get through these moments and these games and what you do before on game days, after mm-hmm. game days. And, you know, and that was in the day when there were 22 guys going out after every game. It wasn't just pick and choose. And so, and then you learned how to play guilty and all these other things. And, and that's, and that's what, but then that, then you learn that now, because I've heard Sid say a couple things about me and I, cause that when, when Daryl Sadar was here and what a great move that was to get Sid, I think we got him out of LA. What, but I mean, dude, slow down. Like you're hyper, like just chill, you know, <clears throat> and he brings that up and I'm like, well, that was just more of you not running me over in a game, much less just settle down. But those are the things that we do as we get older, you stick around long enough. You played 15 years in the NHL. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, as, as time goes on, you're like, yeah, you remember the things that Borny said to you or, or Clarkie said to yeah. you, and then you, that, that's part of what you do. So now you're in St. Louis and I was wondering, cause you, you went from there. And I think after St. Louis, you go to Quebec for a couple of years, you went somewhere yeah. you went to the Nordics, but mm-hmm. St. Did when you got to St. Louis, because everybody talks about that goes through St. Louis and plays in St. Louis, Doug Armstrong obviously, you know, was part of the Dallas Stars organization. I think he's one of the best, if not the best general manager in the NHL. But um, was that kind of your home? Like everybody you, you, I asked this to Eddie. I've asked this to a lot of guys. You play for two or three or four different teams. There's one of those teams that feels like it's home. It would be, I would understand if you said this is home now. Mm-hmm. Right, because but because you're here, but if you look at all the stops that you played in, because you were here in Dallas for what three three years or so, mm-hmm. yeah. When you look at when you look at New York Islanders, uh, Chicago, like I said, you, you that was kind of a pit stop for you, right? And then you end up in St. Louis for four or five years. Oh, I was there twice. I was there at the yeah. end of my career too. You yeah. you finished your career there. Yeah. Do you kind of, because I, I'd ask guys, well, like when, if you want to put a jersey on and wear it out there, what jersey are you going to wear? Like if Eddie, Eddie will tell you, he won, a, he won a cup here for Dallas, but he put the Chicago Blackhawk jersey on and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. What, what would, would it be Dallas or would it be St. Louis? Or? Yeah, it would be uh, St. Louis. Yeah. I had my best um, playing years there where yeah. the team, where I was the biggest part of the team. Yeah. And uh, Dallas would probably be, yes, yeah, second. Um, I, I wish I had been a little healthier when I was in Dallas. Right. I, I, uh, blew my knee out my first year. doesn't help, but, um, yeah, St. Louis. I, so Brian, Brian Sutter was our coach there. And like, he's one of my favorite, he, anybody asked me my favorite coach, it was him. Like, was he, he wasn't, did he not, he coached in Chicago too, didn't he? At he coached some in point Ch- in his career. Were you, was he there when you were there? No, no. Okay. No, no. All right. Yeah. Daryl, yeah, Daryl, uh, I actually had half a year in Indianapolis when I was in Chicago, and Daryl was my coach there, Daryl Setter. And so uh, I think he put a good word in to Brian uh, because I had to clear waivers after my year in Indianapolis, and St. Louis picked me up. But I just love playing for Brian. You know, like. Can you, how do you compare him to Daryl? Oh, Daryl the- gets a rap, right? Daryl has a rap. Yeah, they're pretty similar. Yeah, really? They- yeah, I think they're yeah, they're pretty similar. Brian, so if you played good the night before and Brian walked by you, he'd yeah. punch you. If you didn't get a punch, you better get going. Okay. Yeah. I mean yeah, it's just like way. uh yeah. Well, like the reason I guess I ask you that is Daryl Sutter, you know, now he's in Calgary. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, they made a couple moves last year and brought in, a, you know, Hind, and Huberto comes over there from Florida. But anyway, Huberto didn't have a good year this year. So a lot of talk, the general manager, Roger Living left the team and some, because he didn't want to f- fire Daryl. But anyway, my question is, can those kind of hard nosed coaches succeed in today's game with this brand of player? It, because they, I, I, and that's why I always give Hitch credit because Hitch was that kind of guy for a period. And then, we would talk and then he would ask how he was and what he needed to do. Cause he wanted to change to this type of player. The Daryl Sutter's torts, Tortorella in Philly, not a lot of those guys around, right? They have a, I think they have a short, a real small shelf life, but do they have to learn to adapt or are they just going to go away and never get a job again because of this generational player? I, It's a good question. Lads. I think it's, Something that we talked about at the beginning of the show. We only ask good questions on our yeah. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got to figure out how to motivate your skilled guys and your guys that are your Felinos or your 
Mm -hmm. you know, your hawk and pox or you have to figure that out. And I think maybe to Brian's fault, he, he didn't know how to figure out the cliff runnings of the world, you know, that were on our team um, to the best of their ability. But I loved him. I, I think if you can figure that out, I think you, especially in the playoffs, I think if you're total skill, I think you can get by maybe in the regular season. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you can get by in the right. in the playoffs. So uh, especially the first round, you know, like like we talked about Colorado, their um, their captain um, Landeskog. Land, I mean, in the they play miss him. Yeah, they miss him. <laughs> they definitely miss him. Yeah. So um, I think if you again, if you if you can figure out a combination, I think you you'll have. I I think you know Boston. Boston is that kind of team. I think they they're rugged too. Well, they got some skill. They got a lot of skill, but they're rugged. And I think I think <clears throat> the reason that Monty Jimmy Montgomery is having such a good or a big part of that is because he recognizes that. Now Monty played in different eras, and so he knows. But and the other thing about Monty, which I think is important in today's day from a coaching standpoint, is he was a college coach, and when you coach in college, um. You play two games a week, but you're on duty seven game days a week because you have to know where your players are. It's a college environment. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, we know. I'm. I know. I know. <laughs> I I was in college. I didn't really study in college, but I was there. And there's a lot of distractions, and I think you learn how to relate better to to those players when you're coaching a. And I, I'm sure maybe juniors is the same way. I don't know, but I just know colleges. You're on a college campus. And a lot of times you're the big dog on that campus. You can get away with a lot of stuff and you have to have tabs on these guys 24 seven and you learn how to relate to them, talk to them, blah, blah, blah. And I think now when Monty comes into the NHL, because he's kind of, you know, a player and then he's handled some of those kids. So he's learned how to relate to them. And now he's got younger players here. But then what Monty recognizes, I think in Boston is the team that he has leading with their captain Bergeron. And, <clears throat> You know, they, he understands that that guy right there has a handle on his team, meaning the captain. And I've heard that there was a couple of things. There were some breaks in there once in a while, three, four, five day break. Hey, we're on a good roll here. Let's make sure. And it was, well, you don't have to worry about that. This ain't going to happen. That doesn't happen here. It was immediate, like, ah, uh, so he's got, and he understands that. So I, <clears throat> I haven't talked to Monty, I sent him a couple text messages at one time but i think he's like just lay low just stand back our captains have it and that's not just bergeron you know they got marchand they they have that core group of guys and and i think it's because again at the start of the year we watched i think it was four or five coaches switch teams like pete DeBoer was what in san jose and uh you got Monty was in St. Louis. Uh, Cassidy was in Boston. Got fired in Boston. Goes to Vegas. Rick Bonus, whether you call it st steps away from the game or is released, goes to Winnipeg. And the first half of the year, all these coaches have those new teams in first place. Yeah. But they all got let go from the team that they were with. <clears throat> so it just shows that, you know, Voices get old sometimes, you know, but John Cooper's one that's got it figured out in yeah. Tampa Bay. I mean, he's probably the best, I would say, he's the best coach going right now. He's been there for 11, 12 years and a couple Stanley Cups and the players love him and he knows how to handle them. So it's about how you handle all those players, right? Um, you know, I, Jimmy Montgomery, so he was part of the St. Louis organization. Mm -hmm. He came up after he, we called him up. So he played... In a in a rough era too, like a yeah. tough era, and yeah. but he's a skilled mind. He was a skilled player, so I think that him. Anytime you play, you you have a better understanding what those guys are going through. But if you go through that era, you have a right. Yeah, so I think he knows how to. He didn't. He didn't grow up in a total skilled era. Oh no, he's yeah, seen he both sides oh, of the game. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I got a story about Jenny Montgomery. Oh, do, we well, have time? There's a few stories around here in Dallas about Monty, unfortunately. <laughs> it's not that it's not a story okay. in Dallas, though. <laughs> okay. 
So uh, when I played in St. Louis, like I said, it was my best playing years. And it was Jimmy, Mo not Jimmy Montgomery, Dave Lowry, Richie Sunder, and myself were the Green Bray line. That's what we called ourselves. We checked the best lines. We checked Mo. Yeah. You know. And one day I had a, one game I had a really bad game. And we had a, you know, like in practice we had green jersey all the time. Mm -hmm. Like Holly had a white jersey all the time. Which if people don't know. Yeah. That when you're on this line all the yeah. time and, and things aren't going really well. And sometimes you walk in and you're like, uh oh. Yeah. I, got, I got that that yellow jersey, yeah. which meant you're you're not playing the next game or something like that. Jerseys are a big deal. Oh, in practice. the first thing you oh. look for coming around that room, yeah. and then on a, on a game day skate, it's morning skate. Oh, first thing geez. you do is look at that whiteboard up there. Yeah, my name. Am I on the top four lines or the top six yeah. defensemen? Or am I out here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know exactly. So we had green jerseys, the three of us, and so I came in and I had like you said a yellow jersey, and who was had my green jersey jimmy montgomery mm -hmm. and i mean i almost killed the guy in practice i did everything i almost to like I, i'm almost embarrassed the way i but i slashed him and hacked him and wanted to fight him and and holly holly came up to me brett hall and he's like what are you doing i go i'm getting my green jersey back <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i had my green jersey back but i mean he i i I'll say this about Jimmy, like, I, I don't think there's, there's a correlation between him leaving St. Louis and them not doing as well this year. I, I really think that he added a lot in St. Louis. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think they, well, I think they th probably miss him. <clears throat> that, that's what I mean is I yeah. think some coaches know, they understand that they don't have to have the hammer all the time. Right. They understand their group. And we did it with our... <clears throat> our 18 team last year, not this year, the year before. And I told Addy, the guy I coach with, I said, you know, this goes against the grain of everything I believe in, but we are going to let these guys open it up, you know, and mm -hmm. we're going to get scored on, but we can score goals, you know? And that was the first, I mean, I'm not that guy either. And I'm like, and I gotta, I don't think I had a bottom lip left after, you know, three months biting it off with some of the mistakes and loose coverage and things like that. But we had the kind of team that, all right, we're down a goal, but don't worry about it. So and so is going to go yeah. through and gonna score a goal. So, you, and I think that's where Monty is. I think he understands what it is, and he he probably is smart enough to know. Yeah, we just run seven in a row right here. Let's let's kick him in the butt a little bit in practice here. You know, yeah. Like what do you? Because I remember them times. I mean, like like with Hitch, some of them times, some of the hardest practices after we won four or five games. You know, and Ganey would say, "Hey, hey, it's easy when you're winning." You know what I mean? Sometimes it's easy when you're losing too, because you can. If I have a team that can self motivate themselves. Sometimes that's better. You know, yeah. I'll just take it easy because I know my guys. Yeah. You know, but other times, like, you may have a group of guys, you win three, four, five games, and you're like, yeah, I know what they're going to be doing tonight. I know where they're going. We're <laughs> going to have two shitty games coming up, and I'm not going to let that happen. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, yeah, it's about I, getting to know you. I, I, I'm not saying – I think Ruby's a great coach. I really do. Mm -hmm. But you need – there's a lot of pieces to make a team, right? That's and why I, – I don't think it's – I don't – him going to Boston and doing so well – I think that there's a correlation that he, him leaving the Blues and them struggling. I think he was a a big part of that piece well, in there. I think I yeah. think some of the they don't get the the billing, they don't get the biggest contract, but I think the most in a, a key ingredient or one of the key ingredients is your assistant coach. Oh my god. Your assistant yeah. coach is the buffer between the players and mm -hmm. and the head coach. You know and the head, and that and I think when a head coach <clears throat> uh recognizes that he knows he can be hard because he knows. And I always bring up Rick, Rick Wilson here in Dallas. He was with Hitch for a long time and Hitch could be that guy, but we'll be right there right after practice. Hey, come here. here. Here's what he's trying to say. Well, he ain't doing a very good job. I know, but here's what he's trying to, you know, those, that's why Monty's been the head coach in college and he's been an assistant coach Yeah, and he's the head coach. And now he's got a team that he, re I just think the awareness of, of Montgomery as a head coach in the NHL is with it, you know, and again, Bergeron retires, Krejci retires. He may be different. You know what I mean? He, now he gets a couple new guys. But, <clears throat> well, on that topic, Bass, let's talk <laughs> a little bit about Riley. Let's talk about the kids. You, you, your son is playing in the USHL and Cedar Rapids. Have they started uh, playoffs yet? They start tonight. They start tonight. Yeah, they play in Plymouth. They play the uh, 17s, the National Development Program. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So yeah. they he's playing against Nathan Toby, who he played with um, – uh, 
two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Two years ago, we played with Nathan, a Dallas kid. So, um, they, the development team finished third, we finished six. So listen to this three plays six, mm -hmm. four plays five. So the, we play all three games, best of three in their building, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the winner plays, um, uh, either Chicago or Youngstown who finished first and second, get a bye on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> oh, oh no. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah. they travel, they play, um, what did I say? Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks for coming. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Well, so what's, what's Riley's, and, and this is where I get into the whole youth thing about, you know, this kind of stuff and what do they need to learn? And they watch YouTube and they see highlights and we're trying to tell players, if you're going to make it to the next level, this is who you are. Trust us. We kind of know, but they want to still go out there and score goals. And I knew from when Riley was skating with us and stuff like that, he's got hands. He's probably got better hands than you do. Oh yeah. Right. I Absolutely, mean, yeah. and I noticed that when you guys do play together, you don't pass to each other. I mean, <laughs> you don't pass to anybody else on the team except each other. <clears throat> That's all right. I play with Trevor on Tuesdays and Thursday nights. And so I, I don't pass to anybody else, but Trevor, but I know well, better. Just give, I'd be like Zuby, like give Zuby the puck. I give Trevor the puck. <laughs> Tre Trevor doesn't give it back to me either though. <clears throat> but anyway, um, I, again, now with, with the kids and, and the, the messages that you try to send them, um, Riley is probably a, a different one because I, you know, he's, he has the hockey sense and a lot of that comes from you and playing and all that kind of stuff, but trying, do you ever, did you ever have a hard time with Riley getting him to understand who the kind of player that he was going to need to be to, to keep moving on? Or did, does he instinct like over time being with you enough and coaching, you know, with him and being there and talking to him after every practice that you just feel comfortable that I know you love the coach in Cedar Rapids too. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's got an old school coach. Yeah. Um, he's learning though. Like he's, he's learning the defensive zone through this coach. Yeah. Um, which we have a hard time with getting the kids to buy into that right. zone. Just yeah. be present in that zone, right? Do you find the same thing then? Yeah, I think the 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 offensive lure, like when you watch McDavid and Kinnan. YouTube uh, every, highlights. Yeah, everybody yep. just wants to go. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, you've got to learn the defensive zone, um, how to fight for pucks, how to, you know, be strong. Position. Position, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's cutting his teeth right now. Yeah, but and, well, I would say that Riley is going to be the same kind. And this is what I try to tell players. Like you can be a great offensive player and you can score goals, but I think the, and this is part of Mole's thing too. This is mm -hmm. what happened to Mike. And you know, where you're going to be out there in the last minute of the game. If you know, if we're down a goal, but you want to be out there too, when we're up a goal yeah, to show that you can defend and, you know, play at that end of the ice, you know, and, and for Mike, what he, what he, it took him a little bit, but he understood it was that, geez, if I play this way, I've got the puck a lot more, you know, and you play defensively and you got the puck and, and, and you're in the right spot and you're always not waiting to get it from, you know, let somebody else get, but I'll just go get it. And then I, then I have it more. So but to get them to buy into that, as we call it, that 200 foot game. Yeah. Well, so Mark Carlson's his coach. He's been there 23 years in mm -hmm. Cedar Rapids since the beginning, the team got there in, in Cedar Rapids. But, um, I, so Riley, like probably a lot of kids, they grow up and the consequences like for turning the puck over, maybe not as being as strong defensively, there's not as much consequences because there just isn't, right? Right. But he's there and like, if he turns the puck over, he's not strong on the puck, he, he doesn't play. And it's hard for dad and mom to watch that, but it's good for them because they, they learn then that. You know, like if you turn the puck over at center ice or at the far blue line. So would it's you important. say that would you say that it would have been <clears throat> nice if he didn't have to learn it at that level? He had learned it a couple levels earlier? Well, I think they 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 taught him that, but um He didn't buy into it? No, he did. I think just the consequences are different, right? Yes. Because they don't suffer them at that last level. I think uh, if you play in Dallas your depth of your team is not as strong as if you were in Minnesota or like. So you're going to be out there no matter what. I think there's some yeah. truth to that. Yeah, yeah, of course there is. So, and and that's where that's where I have the thing is like, like you're you're yes you are you're this but 
they didn't suffer the consequences. Right. They, they didn't have to pay the price for the little turnovers and the, and the wrong areas of the ice. Yeah. And, you know, we, we just had the showcase thing going on this weekend and, and you're watching these kids like, and they're, they're so skilled and they skate so well. <laughs> um, but, the, and they don't care when they turn it over. You know, because they didn't get scored on at the last level, and it, they didn't have so. Well, now, that's part of it, right? Yeah, <laughs> is the 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 consequences on the ice too? Yeah, right. Yeah, you turn it over in the USHL, and they're going the other way, and they have a good chance of yeah. scoring. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. that that to me is what we've got to you know keep putting in their heads. And again, they're all not going to be thirty goal scorers at the next level. You know what I mean? And right. if you want to make it, we're trying to tell you when we see a young player, and we're like, you can be this player. This is the player you're going to be. I'm, you're probably not going to be on the top line, but you could be a third line left winger or you could be a third line centerman that is going to get a role that you're going to play for 10 years if you make it, you know, just because mm-hmm. of those characteristics and learn it now because if you get there and go, well, what the hell is this all about? Well, that's what we were trying to tell you because we had a guy that came back to Syria and said, should have listened to you, should have listened to you. Yeah, I know, but we tried telling you and telling you, and that's okay, And but – pass it on to the guys that we're trying to coach this year. Well, it, you know, as if you do, if you play and do all the little things right defensively, you know, all those little things, you, it's the trust of the coach. You're That's, valuable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your coach starts trusting you and then you'll start getting put in different, different roles. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, Glenn Denning is a, a good example. He was one of the best players at Michigan, right? Look at the career he's turned Yeah, out. yeah. Yeah, so I, he, I just I think he's one of the most reliable players oh on this gosh. team. Yeah, <laughs> goes in. Yeah, four checks is responsible in all areas. Penalty killer. He'll fight for his teammates if he has to. He's not going to fool anybody and say he's some heavyweight. Yeah, but those are those are glue guys. They're valuable. Yeah, boy, they're valuable. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk a little alumni, Bass. You're yeah. the Dallas Stars alumni director. How did you ever? How, how did you end up with that thing? You're. What, were you? Did you have a house here when you were playing here, and then you went back to St. Louis? Did you guys always go back and forth? Were you living here then? We kept and, our house here. You did, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, my wife's from here. Mm-hmm. Holly's from here. So, oh, we, there you go. This is home. And what Holly says goes. So, <laughs> you know that. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> you know Holly. <laughs> when it comes to wine or budget. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we won't talk about the budget story unless you want to tell it. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I don't know if I'll tell that story. Okay, <laughs> just give uh, me a chance. It's a great story, but yeah, go ahead. she, um, <clears throat> you know, she grew up in Weatherford, so this is home, and we love it here. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's just does. it's just yeah. so great here. Um, but I, 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 I coached three years when I retired in Salt Lake after you, mm-hmm. and then um, I, coaching wasn't, uh, you know, like it. It wasn't for me, right? It, even though I loved it, and and then so I took about four years off, and uh, I was fishing like five times a week. I I got a boat, and then uh, Holly, my wife, she's like, "You got to do something," you know, like. And so um, I asked Joe. Joe Noondike was the GM at the time for mm-hmm. the Stars. I said, "Joe, I I want to get back in the game," and it's hard to get back in the game if you've been out three or four years. Uh, so he said, "I Joe came from the Flames." And saw how well their alumni is run and how big it is. And he said, why don't you start our alumni? And I thought, okay. I volunteered for two years. And, um, yeah, then they gave me a job. And I love it. I, I've i been there I've been there about 12 years now. And um, Talk about some of, the, some of the games that we do and the things like the charity game and yeah. all that stuff. Well, we play an annual charity game downtown following a Stars afternoon game. And we have a different beneficiary every year. It started um, our very first year. We had a family. um, They were local hockey family. They were en route to Colorado. Yeah. And they got in a car accident. And the one twin, so there's two twins that played on the team. The one died. That's usually how it works. There's two twins. (laughs) I got twins. Yeah. And I got two of them. Oh, yes, you do. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, so the the parents died and and the the twin died and the the uh, sister and the the one kid that played on the team survived and we we had our first annual charity game mm-hmm. downtown for them and we had uh, Segi came out and Ben came out and played with it. You remember yep. right after yep. the game? Yep. And uh, it was I'll never forget it. Mo was there, Nui was there, you were there. I'll never forget that game. And we raised some money for it. We, 
we gave them like a scholarship or some money towards their scholarship, those, those two kids. And uh, so that was our first game. I think we we're in our ninth or 10th year. Mm-hmm. Um, last year we, we brought in the Rangers alumni. So it's been the Rangers, Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis came St. Louis. Yeah. And then sometimes we've played the police. Yes. Uh, we've played different organizations Last year we played for Soupmobile. They were a beneficiary. They feed the homeless in Dallas, and his uh, his name is Soupman. Mm-hmm. Had yeah. his jersey made up for him yeah, and his we, wife. Oh yeah, yeah, they just loved it. We so that's that's what we do. And then uh, With we the also big hurts. Yeah. So the other big event we put on is it's it's called the Dallas Stars Celebrity Big Heart Challenge, and. Essentially, we bring in 16. Last year, we had 16 teams. We brought in 16 uh, former uh, NHL alumni. And there's a draft night, which will be again this year at the end of September. It's a Thursday night. Uh, 16 teams that have raised money for a beneficiary uh, draft 16 alumni, and we play a fun little tournament the next day, three games. And yeah, those are painful games. <laughs> our, our draft, They're short though, Luds. <clears throat> they don't seem short. <laughs> our, dra- our draft night this well, and this year, Wayne Gretzky, you know, makes an appearance. We have Ray, Wayne Gretzky, yeah, Ray Bork, uh, Jeremy Roenick. You know, so you've had some some big NHL guys that have come here. Yeah, we started with eight teams. Uh, I think we're we've had four years now, and we had fifteen teams. We're looking for three more. For this year, it was really neat to have Wayne here, but um, these guys, you know, like the the teams that raise money, the sixteen adult teams that want to play with, you know, guys like Craig Ludwig and Jeremy. Well, they want to drink with him. I don't yes, know they, they do. <laughs> they want to see. They want to see. That's why we need to do one of these fantasy camps where you come and you got six, seven NHL guys. And you spend three days with them. Yeah. And we'll show you how we used to play. And like, wait a minute, we're getting up at seven o'clock. And well, yeah, we got a morning skate. We yeah. Got the, yeah, we'll see. So, but, <clears throat> so Wayne was awesome, man. Wayne came to our draft party and, you know, he, the money that we offered him, he turned around and gave it to the NHL Alumni mm-hmm. Association mm-hmm. for um, guys in need, like former NHL. And so he was awesome. And that was the big hype. And he was just awesome. But the like the feedback we get from the 16 teams and the players is we want to like play with Craig Ludwig and we want to hear stories, mm-hmm. war stories. And I want to hang out with him for two years. And uh, that's what our guys do. Like we bring in a guy like Commodore hmm, and right. guys just love him because, yeah. well, he's got a huge personality and he hangs out with them. This is not to take anything away from Wayne. Hmm. Wayne was fantastic, but uh, and, Tommy, Tommy went first overall in the draft. Yes, he did. And yeah. it was twenty some thousand dollars. Somebody bid on him. Yeah, was it to Ruby? I don't know who it was. Was it Jared? Probably was. Here's the other thing Wayne did, and you know this. He um, he offered two foursomes to um, the golf course, uh, Michael Jordan's golf course. Um, is it called 23 something like what's it called? That would be, that would make sense. I don't know, but yeah. And so he, um, two foursomes, uh, paid, I think about $20,000 each, $30,000 each. And Marty and I went with the two foursomes and played with Wayne. Oh, well, naturally he paid, Wayne paid for everything. He's just. Shouldn't, shouldn't the alumni be going on that trip? <laughs> the rest of us. <laughs> First I'm hearing about this. Yeah. The Grove 23. That's the course it's in Florida. Okay. But like, I just, I can't say enough about Wayne and all our alumni, because as you know, Luds, like, I'll say this, when we played the game, we almost, like in the playoffs, we almost killed each other, right? Opposition, like we played so hard. But then when you retire after so many years, it's almost like we're one family. It was like we actually were teammates. Yeah. And you hated each other when we played against you. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. And so... um, I say that about all the alumni and Wayne's no different. Like we went there, we played at his course. He paid for everything. Um, just classy. Yeah. I I don't, there's not that many, all, all the in alumni are classy, man. Yeah. In, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
There's a reason <coughs> Wayne Gretzky is Wayne Gretzky, not just for what he did on the ice. Yeah. Hey, I will say this, Luds. So our big heart is going to be the last Thursday and Friday in September. Okay. And we're looking for three or four more teams. So if ah, you there you go. If you're in Canada or you're in another state yep. and you want to bring a team of about 15 players, you'll play with an alumni and you'll hang out with a guy like Craig Ludwig. Uh, you can my email is B Basson. So B B A S S E N at DallasStars.com. So if you want to come it's it's you, worth coming. Yeah, if you want to bring a team and you want to drink with Luds and hang out and uh <coughs> you may just make sure your flight is changeable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Bobby, I I uh, I really appreciate you stopping by, and I, I know the ton of work and time that you have to put into that alumni association. And we do have a beautiful alumni room, um, you know. So we'll hopefully we're in the we're in the finals here with our Dallas Stars, and maybe we'll have a uh, some kind of a watching party for yeah, we, for a Dallas Stars game in there. We do like need that. to do that. Yeah, we'll 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 do that. We can make a podcast out of that too. We'll we'll do a little show in there. We can. It's it's a room we want to show off. It's such yeah, a beautiful room, and we got our own little bar in there. And Diddy's got his sauna in the showers, and we got our locker room in there. Man, we're fortunate. Aren't trainers we? Yeah. now. We got a <laughs> trainer now. We got Andrew who does the guy's skates. So. Um, you've guys done a, a hell of a job and we should mention Gerald Diddick because he's been a big part of helping you out with everything that you do. Yeah. He's fantastic. Yeah. He, um, he doesn't skate fast, but he's, yeah. Yeah. But he's just like, um, he's a giving guy, you know, like he's given his time yeah. to, to help us get going. And, you know, like you talk about the dressing room, it's one of the things we miss as players. I'll tell this, are you got time? Yeah. So it's your show. So we we started our alumni association. This, uh, as I said, Joe wanted to get an alumni presence here, and uh, one of the first things we did was we skated on a Friday up in mm -hmm. Frisco. And I kept asking Craig Ludwig. I said, like, why aren't you coming out to our skate? And he goes, well, if you get us a dressing room, build us a dressing room and and a bar. Yep, <laughs> yep, <laughs> and a bar. Then I'll come out and skate. So we. Um, Jason Ferris, who was our CFO, CFO at the time with the stars, we went up and visited St. Louis who had a nice mm -hmm. alumni dressing room. And, um, you know, between the stars and Jason, like we, we made it happen. And guess who, who started coming in, coming to our skates was Craig Ludwig because we had a dressing now room. Now I'm complaining because there's not enough of them. We don't skate enough. Oh yeah. Yeah. I bet we have the other nights. So but I will guys, say but. this about Luds. Like whenever I ask Luds to do something for our alumni, he's there. Yeah, it's, I, uh, I'm, I, yeah, we're all like that here, though. I think. No, no, I think yeah, the guys, I think you're like you know. Yeah, you're one of the the we're, best for we're, that. So. We're good. Yeah, our guys are good. I like getting out. I like getting <coughs> out and about, boss. All right, Bobby Basson. Uh, I appreciate you hopping on Suds with Luds today, and uh, it is time. I've been sitting here for an hour and a half now, watching four bottles of Herman Marshall <laughs> spin around in a circle, and I haven't even. I got the the Herman Marshall jug here. Now my ice is basically water. So it's time for me to have a cocktail. So thank you, uh, Bass, for coming here. And thanks for everybody for listening. We will be back again next week. And go Stars tomorrow night's Tuesday night. Big game five. Later. Thanks, lads. I appreciate it. You got it. Thank you to Herman Marshall Whiskey for sponsoring another episode of Suds with Luds. Herman Marshall produces small batch, handcrafted, and award-winning whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels. Whether it's their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. Make sure you ask for it by name. Thank you again, Herman Marshall Whiskey.